Yeah, my name's Anne Marie Culhane, and I um, I have an eco social practice, which mostly takes place in um, outside of gallery and museum contexts. So I'm mostly working in um, city parks, or I'm sometimes working in farms. Um, I might be working in community centres. I might be working on in the street or with community organisations. Um, I might be working in pop-up spaces and shops. Um, so what the so my work is, I guess. Um, emerges from a, a question or a, some research that I'm really interested in doing. So I'd say I would frame my public art and all of my practice around being active um, research. And um, what I've decided to do in my practice is draw people into the research and um, take them on a journey with me through an investigation or a series of investigations, looking at particularly looking at sites but it might also be looking at particular questions around ecology or our connection to the natural world. And it might also be looking at the systems in which we operate. Um, and, and in particular, I'm very interested in the food system and our relationship um, in many different ways to the food system, whether that's as consumers, whether that's through the wider economy, whether that's culturally, historically, um, so I think, yeah, I'm probably an artist researcher and an eco-social artist and all of my work is participatory. But in the very, very early stages of making the work, um, I do have quite a lot of time on my own um, reflecting and I've noticed over time that actually part of my thinking and reflective and early research stages involves writing and drawing and also uh, a form of embodied practice yeah yeah that's really helpful yeah um so at the moment can you maybe tell us a couple of projects that you're kind of working on at the moment that it kind of in, sort of include some of those kind of processes that you've just spoken about yeah so i'm, I'm this year i'm working on two big new projects and but then I also have some long-term projects that are ongoing so they kind of come into the mix as well but I'll just talk about for the moment I'll just talk about um, tidelines and walking forest so walking forest has evolved through um, a relationship with three other artists who are Ruth Ventoven who was um, the creative director of Encounters Arts Shelley Castle, who is a visual artist with a social practice, and Lucy Neal, who was the director, co the founder and co-director of the Lyft International Theatre Festival in London and the author of Playing for Time, which is a book about the social practice. And we actually uh, co-evolved a project about two years ago which we've been working towards getting funding for and we haven't given up on and we've now got funding for a season for change which is um, um, funded by the Arts Council and is produced by Julie's Bicycle and Arts Admin um, and we've worked with Arts Admin before and season for change is looking at um, holding a frame or holding Space for programming work around climate change um, in lots of different venues across the country. So it's more about creating a platform to draw out and highlight and encourage venues to engage with climate change related work in their spaces. Yeah. And they also, in their funding bid, um, wanted to commission some new work. So I think there's four or five new commissions and we walking forest is one of those new commissions um so we are walking forest is about looking at a few different threads and as you hear from me you'll hear that quite 
a lot of my projects are com complex and weave together different narratives. Yeah. Um, so what we're looking at in Walking Forest is a strand which is around um, female activism in this country. So we were looking at our heritage in terms of female activism and quite obviously you have the story of the suffragettes um, who've just had the, the sort of 100 year anniversary of the first female vote. And actually what we want to do is draw out some other more hidden elements of the work that they were doing. So we were researching the connection of the suffragettes to the natural world. To We were looking also at some areas of their work that are less, I, I, I think the surveying and the reviews of the suffragettes are still being quite superficial. I yeah. think it's still quite a hidden narrative. Yeah. It was a really, really dynamic, rich, um, overwhelmingly incredible publicity and PR <laughs> campaign that they ran um, with depths of engagement and intelligence in terms of how to engage wide audiences which are just phenomenal and there's so much there to to excavate and draw from yeah. and um, within that story we found a, a story of an arboretum that was planted by suffragettes whilst they were in the middle of their campaign so that it was nowhere near the end they, they were still in an unknown phase of their work and they planted this incredible arboretum which mostly got destroyed in the 1960s but there's one tree left mm -hmm. so this one tree has become part of our the core of our narrative for walking forest Where, whereabouts um whereabouts is that and it's near bath it's in a place oh. called bath eastern it's in the garden yeah, okay. of somebody um oh, okay. a woman called a woman called eileen who's a midwife okay so it's in someone's personal garden now and she lets us come in and do all sorts of <laughs> events in her garden that's really so that's a public space that we're using um well not public private space that she's allowed to be public um and um, we're also growing on seeds from that tree and we've also gifted seeds from that tree to um, campaigners and activists all around the world so we took some of the seeds from that tree to the COP climate talks um, in Poland two years ago and they they were gifted to some of the people that were negotiating some of whom are from uh, other parts of the world mm -hmm. so we're weaving together that we're sort of looking at that story and we're also weaving that together with contemporary um, female activists who are around the world are defending particularly forests but also defending land yeah. and who are in a completely different space to us and are in this I guess d democratic privilege position we have in this country at the moment as activists whereas a lot of them are, are putting their lives on the line and are, are under their families are under threat for the work that they do to defend the land so we're we're trying to very tentatively and sensitively um, see if we can engage with some of those women and help share their stories so, over here so it's an interna it's international so yeah yeah and at this at the same time we're we're doing we're running some training camps or sort of um creative training camps for female act young female activists in different parts of the uk um, so one is part of um, City of Culture in Coventry, yeah. um, one in Dolby Forest in Yorkshire, which is Forestry Commission, and one in Torbay and Dartmoor. Okay. So, how were those locations selected? With that, did that come out of just your research and and sort of being people responding in those places, or were they kind of specific? That we wanted to work in different con really different contexts so we we kind of in our wish list was to have a sort of rural and urban and a something else mm -hmm. and then um torbay and dartmoor we've got connections uh anyway through existing practice yeah because um, we're in that part of the world yeah. also torbay's quite i mean it's a it's a it's sort of got an idyllic it's beautiful but it's actually very deprived um, socioeconomically yeah. and um we we work with a, a charity called more trees which works up on dartmoor so we wanted to connect those things yeah. and then um the forest commission were really keen to to work with us and they suggested Orby forest yeah. um and then um coventry 
yeah that again that was through a, a connection that we've got there and but it's even perfect absolutely perfect as our urban mm. um so we're looking at sort of activism female-led um what that what those relationships with the land are how to articulate them how they might be part of our heritage yeah. um how they're they connect us globally to other women and also within the context of the forest looking at sort of the forest ecosystem which gives us this incredible metaphor anyway for this type of hidden work because it's so much of the work in the forest is happening under the ground through the mycelial networks that link up the trees mm -hmm. and exchange nutrients and support one another so we're, we're we're entwining all those narratives together yeah, yeah. and we and our kind of one of our out one of our outcomes is to create a big performative participatory piece at at the time of the cop climate talks okay. so they were going to be in november in yeah. glasgow <laughs> <laughs> and now we don't know when they're going to be i think it, they're probably going to be summer or late spring okay. next year so yeah. And kind of work a slightly longer time frame to work to <laughs> yeah yeah so i think what was your question to start off that just to talk about your practice a bit and about the project you're working on so that's sort of great i mean one thing i i mean that project you've just spoken about did that i'm assuming you were approached to do that project or no so how so, be quite interesting to for people to hear how that kind of manifested itself in initially yeah actually i did want to talk about that because a very few of the projects I'm, I'm. How does it work? <laughs> um, it's complicated, doesn't it? It's sort of a variety of ways, I think, um, and I think that's useful for artists to understand who are not working this area. I think perhaps I, think like it's always a response to a brief, but that's not obviously always the case. Yeah, no. I was thinking I very rarely apply apply for funding. I yeah. usually get invited to do work although with walking forest it's been a nightmare to get funding for <laughs> so we've uh, we've written about i don't know five or four or five do you know what that might be do you think or uh yeah so the kind of work that i'm doing i think is quite hard for some funders to kind of frame or it's hard to talk about because it's so process orientated yeah. and it's so you can't it's not based on objects or a tangible yeah uh outcome it yeah. tends to be emergent it tends to be site responsive mm -hmm. and responsive to the people who come into the space of the project so it's dynamic yeah. Yeah. so unless people so what happened actually this is probably quite interesting so most of the work that i get is is repeat work from people that work with me yeah. <laughs> once yeah. and then commission me again That's the process yeah so for example we take a part i worked with them for probably four years and um, we kept doing projects once i'd done a project um and other funders that the same things happened yeah they tend to want to either try and continue the project that we're doing because they can see it's, the it's being successful yeah. or, or they work with me to find other funding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's really useful to know because I think um, so much, I think often working in public spaces, there's a real trust element to developing projects. And that's very hard, I think, sometimes to bring on board people like local authorities and developers that quite a lot of that money sits within um, and I think that there's a we really need to work on that area to kind of release the, the you know there is a lot of money there which could be going towards much sort of you know sort of projects that could be much more longer term and have a much bigger sort of you know effect with the people who live in those areas as well so I yeah think. I mean the thing is that if you've got a relational practice then actually you kind of want a relationship with your funder as well so yeah. It's yeah. much better for me if the funder wants to engage in some way, even if it's just coming to the odd event yeah. to experience what's happening. Yeah. If the if the funder is at arm's length and they're wanting a kind of project with a clear parameter, yeah. <laughs> that's possible. They're probably not going to get that from me. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really difficult. Um... 
we are working with, I don't know if you're aware of Ixia, who were very active a number of years ago. They're in sort of a, um, a, sort of a, pub, a public art think tank, but they mm. lost their funding from Arts Council on that big round where lots of organisations lost it about four or five years ago. Yeah. Um, and we're, try we're trying to see whether we can reactivate the network, but and also kind of think through those kind of changes that kind of need to happen and enable that a kind of platform for that to kind of make some changes, I think. Um, whether that will happen is another, you know, I'm not sure, especially with all this now happening with um, the coronavirus. But yeah, I think it would be great to see some changes in those areas, I think. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, what, what can be helpful is if you do, I mean, you could do it, sometimes it's useful to do a pilot. Mm. So you yeah. can, if, if you need to, so much of my work is, yeah, you have to be part of it or to observe it or witness it to understand how, how it's working, how it's impacting yeah. um, in place and with people. So um, and one way to think about doing that if you're approaching it for the first time is just to do a small version of what you want to do and just allowing people to see what that opens up yeah um and and to seed something and also you get so much feedback from doing a pilot it can be really useful if you're entering a new form of practice yeah, yeah to yeah. try something out without the pressure of it being this kind of one-year project or something big or your first big commission absolutely. yeah 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 absolutely yeah um okay um so was there a point at which you were initially drawn to working in, in public space or did that just naturally happen coming out of your practice there wasn't one particular was there one particular project that you first you know, your first ever commission that can you sort of think back to that or well yeah i was thinking about this it's quite so i um set up an art space in edinburgh called out of the blue okay. trust and um we and I was cu kind of curating that and I did all the work to set it it was a sort of um again socially engaged so it was trying to provide a space for art forms or artists who are not getting into or not kind of interested in the big um, flagship spaces in Edinburgh Edinburgh is quite institutional mm -hmm. and has big big galleries and we were trying to creep it keep a much more lively spirit going throughout the year which sort of kind of comes in the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and then goes yeah. and then everyone else is going no nothing else happens the rest of the year so we were trying to keep that energy going and be much more sort of experimental and fringy but then I wanted I decided that I really wanted to develop my own practice um, and I went and did a, a master's in interdisciplinary arts mm -hmm. um, and then I came back to Edinburgh and I made a, a, a I had a residency on Arthur's Seat I don't know if pe people may know Arthur's Seat it's a massive ex-volcano um, oh, yeah. hill yeah. In the, you, yeah. if you go to Edinburgh you'll see it yeah. Yeah. and it you can see it anywhere in the city and it's kind of this big iconic um, public space which everyone has some form of relationship to and it's got this incredible history and, and geology so I wanted to do a residency there and I kind of set it up for myself okay. so I went and got uh, got some Millennium Commission funding and I spoke to Historic Scotland and I spoke to Scottish Natural Heritage and I asked them if they wanted to fund me <laughs> it's quite I'm quite when I've got an idea I can be quite yeah. sort of driven and bullish and I'm, I'm also not I guess with that level of commitment I'm not that I, I, I'm not shy so I've just kind of got meetings with people and went and said this is what I want to do I think this will be great for you so it was self-initiated then yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 and um yeah they all said yes after a while and um I so I, I was resident there for about nine months and I was just looking at this little book which I did as part of it which yeah. was which was a free so the idea of this little book was it was free and it was put in loads of public spaces after I'd done the piece so already in that work there was a sense of kind of giving back and sharing mm. more widely so this went in all the libraries and all around town yeah. and also the content of this is lots of different voices so it is um 
it's come through questionnaires which I asked people about how they felt about the site and what they were doing there it's come from interviews it's come from diaries it's come from submitted artworks from all around the world from people that have have a relationship with that site so again I'm kind of curating yeah and making work at the same time yeah um yeah so I'm using lots of different hats and yeah. and, what, and what I'm trying to do is the kind of baseline is for that is just to give this kind of really multiple lenses or multiple perspectives on a particular site yeah. so I'm not, it's kind of the antithesis I guess of placing in a piece of work <laughs> that's one thing that's oh, yeah. one interpretation I'm trying to be a lens or a, a siphon for lots of different perspectives yeah um, and not offer a definitive definition of what that space is um, um, so I'd imagine because it was self-initiated you you know you learn on your own terms I suppose and that kind of like you said you have to contact people and sort of set that up yourself and it, it, you sort of there wasn't anybody else sort of putting that you know sort of a certain expectations on that so yeah so much yeah much more freedom obviously you've, you need to do reporting and the, the complexity becomes when you're working with the different partners from different disciplines is that you need to keep reframing what you're doing yes so historic scotland wants to see a different kind of report or they're they're only really interested in the historical aspects scottish natural heritage are only really interested in the, in the natural world and the natural heritage so i'm having to work a little bit hard to yeah. make sure that they're all in your approach to who you're speaking to yeah 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 okay um i thinking i was going my sort of next question was about sort of perhaps the most successful project you've worked on and sort of the reasons for that and the kind of learning experience from that um when did what that what which project that might have been from <laughs> some portfolio yeah um <laughs> i think i guess well i had a couple of thoughts yeah. here because because success depending on how, how I'm defining it. It's yeah. <laughs> so, uh, successful in one way, it was a field of wheat, okay. which was um, 2015 to 2016, but then with two years of research before that, and yeah. that was a collaboration with Ruth Levine and uh, subsequently the farmer, Peter Lundgren. And why was it successful? So it's it was... Um, mm -hmm. I think we really so we had a, we ended up with a collective of forty two people who went with a, went on a journey with us over the um, whole growing period of the wheat field. So from planting the seed through to harvesting, we created a participatory process. Some would say it was almost a performative process where people were with us. Um, experiencing the field, experiencing the wider um, connections that the field had in many ways to culture, history, mm. economics, etc. And we gave the collective moments where they could come together either on the farm or we went to the City of London and had a tour around looking at the history of global um, commodities trading and wheat trading through physically entering the spaces where the corn exchange for example where all of the wheat from around the UK was traded or um, where the barges used to come and land the first wheat and draw a chalk circle on the floor where the trading happened through to speaking to um, Goldman Sachs who are key commodity traders and speaking to a natural trader from there so we took people kind of down all these different strands that came off from this one field which we were deeply connecting to um, through looking at the soil through looking at the history of the land before it became a field looking at the seed looking at how the farmer worked the land yeah. um, looking at the biodiversity and working out as a collective kind of living a parallel world in the parallel world to the farmer yeah. and hand in hand with the farmer managing the field making decisions about how he was managing the crop <laughs> um so it was really hands-on and also really reflective and really based around dialogue and we the 42 people in the collective were from different 
backgrounds some are overseas so they're connected through a, a really active website yeah, yeah. and never came to the field but they received things from us which was like the soil from the field and things um and then others came on two or three of the yeah the visits and how did um how did they how did they get select were those a selection process or um, no we just put out a call for people to join the collective yeah. and um and then we, we just did this huge recruitment drive where we went we you know we tried for many many different mm. i guess groups and yeah. different platforms to get the message out because yeah. we wanted that diversity in the mix so that is a huge part of a participatory process as well if yeah. If people want to work really want truly want to engage with a diverse group then your recruitment process is a big chunk of your time yeah um and really important and how you word those invitations yeah. is, is critical so yeah we got this this 42 people together i would say that we had because because there was a financial investment we wanted there to be a financial investment so people were actually going to be gambling along with the farmer which is yeah. sensibly what's happening yeah. um, that might have um, i kind of wish that we'd had a few more subsidized places and support for people that were financially maybe not able to join it was something like 150 pounds okay. and people people made something like four pound profit at the end <laughs> um so we had we did have local people but i think I guess another time I would have just tried to have worked even harder to get people involved that may not financially be able to do it. Um, but we did have an incredible type of diversity of different professionals and um, opinions and age groups. So that was amazing. And we created a whole system for how they might have um, considered and a more reflective dialogue which was based on the quaker um methodologies for dialogue yeah um, that's a whole another conversation we'll be able to time for now but also if you're working with dialogue techniques or trying to bring people into conversation and some of your um, areas of inquiry are quite contentious it's mm -hmm. really you need to be just really mindful of the frameworks that you're using for dialogue yeah there's so much yeah yeah um i just it, dialogue doesn't automatically happen well <laughs> at yeah. all particularly in public space yeah. so um so we did we we kind of got people to sign up to it and agree to uh these these really i think great um methodologies tried and tested mm -hmm. which enabled people to speak much more from their own place of truth and less confrontationally yeah, yeah. that was really helpful and I, and I learned loads through that so I'd say that was really successful because I've gone on to be able to use that in like other projects yeah further projects and I think one of the success for me was probably the last event we did which was the harvest event so we ended up the collective wanted to keep something like a hundred kilos of the flour and it ended up getting milled in a in a windmill locally and then um so we had this kind of resource to play with um and we did a harvest event and at that point we we sort of having curated this i think quite sort of in depth and rich series of events and conversations for people we then turned it back to the collective and said right co-curate with us what do you want to do and that was a kind of critical moment for us because it was about uh, exchange and gift it's like mm. this is what we've offered to you what can you what are you prepared to bring back into the mix and then we had this beautiful day where collective members who had certain skills offered to do talks or some people started baking bread they said right, i'm going to lead a whole baking workshop somebody else made it did like a music workshop from found objects around the farm somebody else did painting with pigment from the soil of the field and uh, we had some architects on the collective who made a straw bale structure for us to meet in um so there was this sort of village fate all this kind of all these different skills of the collective they could feed it back in yeah but with context of the project so and in a way we were then held by them yeah partly 
so that that was lovely and, and another area of success I would say was that we ended up having a half hour feature on on your farm which is a early morning farming show yeah, yeah. which you might have heard being a mother <laughs> on Sunday mornings at like six yeah. and it has a ridiculous number of people listen to it something like four million listeners or something and it's mo and a lot of them are farming community yeah. so to have our, our show back in the context of farming as yeah. a whole program feature was great that's the kind that's an, a conversation and audience that we really wanted to reach yeah yeah but it wouldn't necessarily kind of connect sort of an art sort of practice with the you know farming practice so yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah and we had um a legacy so i'm also always really thinking about legacy of projects and we had uh two of the collective members then went on to set up their own version of field of wheat so, but kind of taking away some of the creative aspects and just looking at how do we collectively manage uh arable farms could we work could we work that as a collective system where people are much more involved with the farmer so it's a little bit like um community supported agriculture where people buy in and support a fruit yeah. and veg farmer yeah. but they actually then took it on and ran a project called hashtag our field which was trying it out mm. so yeah. it's spun off that's a really nice spin off. I felt that they had those kind of skills kind of to move, to sort of go on and do it themselves about yeah. Yeah. So I think that's another so, so, yeah. It comes back to my practice but some of the projects that I've done have got have I've intentionally created sort of models or designs that people can then take. There's not a sort of there's an open source ness <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to sharing. Yeah. learnings to sharing findings yeah yeah um that project then so how did that uh, did that come from from a sort of self-initiated way or did that come from somebody you know a kind of organization with whether it was an organization involved in that or oh i think uh, i can't uh, dance for interestingly yeah. it was a, a dance for um ruth had a relationship with a producer there okay and i think they asked her whether she wanted to do some uh, whether it's the right way around yeah a tiny small bit of money yeah and we both and, I, and ruth and i'd worked before together before and we said this is what we want to do we want to just go into a, a one of these fields and see what it feels like mm. <laughs> And then it all came from there. So it all came from a tiny little pocket of money. Yeah. Then we got research money from Arts Council. Okay. And then we applied for a, a, a bigger chunk of funding from Arts Council and got more money from the University of Lincoln. So it, was, so it was actually quite an organic process that it sort of grew in sort of stages like that then. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I was, when I was looking at that project, it really reminded me of that 1980s the cut project by Angus Dean, it was sort of with the, sky, the sort of New York skyline behind the field. Um, and I'm not sure, do you, are you, do you know the collective future farmers from San Francisco in America? Uh, a few, a future farmers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They do some fantastic work around, yeah. um, they've just done, they did some work around wheat, didn't they? And the, the story of wheat um, on a boat. Yeah, and then we worked with them when I was at Situations. We worked with them in Oslo, and we built a bake house as, as one of the commissions. And kind of there was a big sort of project around that, and sort of as a way to kind of connect. There's quite a lot of different um, sort of communities, in particularly in sort of city centre Oslo, and then sort of connecting them through their kind of individual sort of cultural breads and things like that. So this bake house now exists, and people can come and use that um, to to bake whatever they want in it. But there was sort of a wider kind of program. Um, quite a few years before that bake house finally happened but yeah that sort of reminded me of <laughs> some of their work as well that project so. yeah I mean I think for me there's there's always a oh I'm always curious about what would have happened next and people were automatic because it's a cycle people automatically say oh if we try this next year why isn't it going longer <laughs> um because you're sort of on you're off it's like you're not yeah. to just stop it mm. I suppose that's, that's, that's the advantage. That's the importance of perhaps building in that learning, so that 
you know when you're when you as the artist are not there that things can kind of you know progress and move on and that things don't just stop and that people feel that they can kind of take on somehow and, and sort of do that themselves as well yeah I mean one of the key learnings <laughs> from that project which probably comes from working with Ruth yeah. um was to document the work really well so particularly if you're working in a in a if sort of process-based ephemeral way then having good documentation of what you're doing is really really important so i definitely build that in if people are not working in the public realm with people yeah um to make sure you're just because because <laughs> it's invisible yeah but anyway yeah <laughs> yeah so at least people can see it on one level when it's documented yeah and also it's complex it helps remind me of all the different things that we did yeah yeah um okay that's great and um, i suppose in a sort of slightly outside a sort of opposite to that you know i'm just wondering kind of what the you know because working in public space is, is complex and there are you know there may be the difficulties that you've encountered in projects and perhaps how you've sort of negotiated those difficulties, whether there's one particular project or there's been aspects of sort of a couple, I don't know, so. Yeah, so, so um, Fruit Roots is, is an interesting project to talk about. It's in public space and it's on a, it's on a university campus. So it's, so the sort of, I guess the custodians of that space and the management of the university and then the ground staff, so you've got, different sort of different people with different interests in it and um that I've I've been doing that project for nine years now and there's been moments where there's been tensions between um some of the some of the subjects that I've wanted to to frame with in the space of fruit roots which is a, a kilometer long orchard and it's a route that we repeatedly, I guess, and quite ritually walk at different seasons with different practitioners and different public um, participants. For, and it bridges the local community of Loughborough with university staff, with students, yeah. which not that many mm. projects at Loughborough do. So it's quite unique. And increasingly in my work, I've become more open about um, some of the I guess drivers for me which are around um, trying to bring people more bring people into people's awareness more about um, climate change and ecological crisis and the sort of dysfunctionality of our food system and I I've named that more in the work and that can sometimes bring be a bit edgy <laughs> for yeah. institutions yeah. Um, because it feels like it's borderline active artist activism um so if you're working in a conservative con context um which a university shouldn't be <laughs> so i can usually argue that case but that's in terms of what i've wanted to put on there that sometimes i've had i've had a little bit of a clash and had to really argue my case and also with people that are maintaining on the ground because i'm not there yeah yeah and the yeah. ground I, ground stuff I have to you know I'm really respectful of them and I really have to thank them for the work that I'm doing when I'm not there maintaining something which needs yeah. care and love yeah and I can't expect them to do that yeah so that's about having a really clear relationship with them and 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 once in nine years so it's not too bad but with this, there was a moment where that had to be renegotiated and yeah reset that relationship because yeah. um it was problematic so and I think the other thing yeah, and a, a challenging commission for me was working in a public space, a green, a park in Exeter. So I worked with, it was a Ginkgo Projects mm. Commission. So I worked with the Environment Agency and uh, so they were a key partner. They were doing flood, flood defence works. Mm. And uh, I think there was just, they, they don't, they haven't experienced working with artists before. Yeah. It was complete. And yet they kind of, were like yeah 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 that's all fine I'm like and it's been a complete nightmare yeah 
<laughs> so they initially um, said yes, but maybe not quite understood what. Not understanding what was involved yeah. and the and the and the rigor and the depth of, of what I was doing. Yeah. And it was around planting fruit trees, and it was around community. Yeah. Getting involved, yeah. and what their perception of that was, and what my perception of what that was going to mean for all of us. Yeah. It's completely different. And as an as the artist, because I, you know, there, there was a, a commissioner involved in that. Did you feel uh, sort of protected or supported through that difficult process in a way? Or no, no, okay. The, the, because the because the um, so actually, Gigco had a tiny tiny budget really, mm -hmm. so they weren't really managing me. And then my manager was not from an arts background. Right. Okay. And has is really tied into the sort of um, Exeter. Uh, I don't know what's it called the sort of green economy and the green that he he works in that field. So he's got personal relationships with these people that he doesn't want to ruffle. Right. So I was really abandoned. <laughs> uh -oh, <I> <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Yeah. So my, I guess looking back at what I could do differently is immediately just go th make a memor memorandum of understanding, yeah. have a written agreement. Okay, this is, but when I say this, this is what I mean. Yeah. And yeah. you agree to all of this. Even so, though, um, working in the public realm now is getting, I would say, more and more challenging because, and it may be more so after COVID because of the, all the all the people that I work with are under such massive pressure. Yeah. They're overworked. They yeah. can't do their job anyway. This arts is so often seen as an add-on. Yeah, the expectations and, and pressures, I think, yeah. Are huge. So basically, it's... So now, for example, Environment Agency, they contract and subcontract. So I'm not even talking to the Environment Agency anymore. I'm talking to a subcontractor who hasn't, doesn't even know who I am. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which I think makes a real big argument, you know, so much for that person that can kind of, you know, work with you as the artist and kind of support that, that dialogue and enable you to do what you have been asked to do, you know. So I think... Yeah, I think it's. I think that. I think. I think you're right. I think it is getting very difficult. I, yeah, um, and I think there's also that thing of, oh, we need to have a. We we've got money and we absolutely. You know, we we're being made to put in an art project in these in these spaces and sites and developments. But, you know, the people who are you know they're not wanting to do that. They don't understand those processes and, and yeah, they're sort of leaving it to the last minute and then they're sort of. You have to turn a project around in three months and with the smallest of budgets and, and that yeah that that's absolutely needs to change i think yeah. there's also uh, what i noticed in that project is that i as the artist because i was the only person in the public that was actually in dialogue or contact mm. with the public in those spaces that i became a siphon for people's disgruntlement yeah. <laughs> and yeah. uh, frustration with the partners yeah. on the project yeah so suddenly i was kind of getting all this vitriol and yeah what's happening why have we got this wall here and we don't understand what's <laughs> this blood scheme doesn't make any sense i'm just like whoa and actually you know i to my credit i think i did an incredibly good job i'm um, at like being a peer so, yeah 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 but that again that's all going to be hit hit that subtle yeah what is completely hidden yeah. And actually, when they were being so unconstructive with me, I was just like, don't realise what I'm actually doing on the ground. Just to... yeah. So, yeah. And do you, and I, I mean, do you feel that your that the project, your work in that context, then suffered because of those processes and that that situation, or were you able to kind of you know sort of work through that in some way? Um, it it definitely has. So um, yeah, because. Um, the whole idea was that, that this sort of we had this whole build of one year where I was working really intensively on the project and we had a big event to launch it and there was a lot of interest and it was and then because because of lack of clarity from the from the people on the ground I ha I wanted to move immediately into sort of forming a community group that we're going, then going to take it on and we've just had like a two-year delay for doing that 
so people have fallen away yeah so there's this like critical mass and momentum and energy built by the energy that i put in and mm -hmm. the community that gathered around and it was brilliant and unless that's can evolve into something else yeah it dissipates yeah yeah well i was just going to quickly talk because i was thinking about successful projects and yeah. um the field of wheat which and um which sort of had the long term and the legacy um fruit roots i was just maybe going to just speak about how that yes yeah, so and that's nine years <laughs> really long term and interesting in terms of the sort of nuts and bolts of that that came through an arts so that came through radar so i love university arts yeah um and they invited me to propose a project and they do i think it was at that point they were doing like three monthly projects mm -hmm. which is fairly healthy for yeah. a project but i proposed something that was the kind of 50 year project <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, ah. Um, so they then passed my proposal on to the wider university, and then I presented the project to. So they kind of helped because they gave me that that they had my. In fact, they kept, one of the producers came with me to this meeting, mm -hmm. and I met the sustainability team and the estates team, and all my funding since then has come through them. So all of my funding for Root Roots has come through sustainability. Right, okay. Um, so it's, um, because the university see it as absolutely part of their, one, their engagement, public engagement, and two, yeah. improving the grounds and biodiversity and yeah. all of that. And yeah. more and more I'm becoming part of the teaching system there. Okay. So that's, that was quite an interesting... Yeah journey for that project that landing crew i was just going to talk about which is something i've been doing for the last um since last october which i would say has quite it's been quite successful and fun and is part of um so it it's it dovetails in with extinction rebellion mm. um actions it's an independent thing though yeah. um and it's um look it's a performative street based piece around um gosh many different things but it, primarily it's looking at um getting people to just look at their relationship to flying mm -hmm. and the impact on the climate but it, again it breaks on multiple levels so it's quite visually powerful and we're we're dressed as um, air traffic controllers <laughs> yeah, i've seen the pictures on your website yeah um but what also happens is that uh, it's based on really uh, slow movement so it's it's a kind of form of semaphore mm. and it uh, is a little bit like tai chi or something like that so the movements are really slow and gentle and when the when we're training the performers we're talking about breath and grounding and it's about the performers having a real sense of something that's feeding them so it's kind of a form of meditation <laughs> but it happens within the context of um protest yeah and um, so it has a real impact on the field or the public space around it so when we've done it in context of people getting arrested or it's like a city airport or even trafalgar square it really changes the atmosphere of what's going on it's quite calming um it's quite reflective but it's quite powerful <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and for, so, for the, so, it's, so it has an impact on other people around and it has an impact on, on the people that are performing it and the feedback from people that have done it is that it just gives them a really different way to be in, the, in a protest situation, mm -hmm. yeah. which yeah. is quite nourishing, um, but also it's got a very strong visual aesthetic and I mean, you know, there's no, fly, no planes in the sky at the moment, I'm only joking. Yeah. But, <laughs> No, it's. But I think why why for me that's successful because of the feedback of people who are involved. Yeah. Because the whole uh, being an artist and being able to offer something really different yeah. that's performative, that's sort of uh, reflective, mm. um, that's aesthetically interesting in yeah. those contexts is really needed and really important 
Um, because yeah, I, I, I thought it was interesting because you have this performance element of your practice and then you're doing these public art projects which you know are very generous and the involvement of people and the time you're spending sort of bringing those people into those projects is the kind of performance element your way of sort of having that kind of more intimate space for yourself as an artist within those or because they I quite often see them in the projects you kind of build it in so you'll perform you might you know the kind of WAF style and kind of with the ultra projects and um yeah I just wondered yeah I was just sort of interested in that Mm, yeah I think it's I guess the, the practice that's all my way in I think is through embodied yeah practice so it's the start point and the end point yeah. um but then it expands out from there but very yeah. much the first part of a process will be deep listening mm without doing anything is yeah. just being somewhere and listening yeah. um and i think that that involves not just sort of the mental process but mm -hmm. something subtle and different around an embodied process yeah and then the response comes from there and i also think particip participation through dialogue is great i think when you're actually physically doing making participating passing around a bowl it's another whole level of connection and um i don't know memories get made that way yeah yeah yeah, yeah. how much do we remember an exact conversation but we remember something we've done yeah and i quite often think you know sort of you're quite often i you know the people are wanting permanent artwork still you know that kind of thing of permanence and it being there for a certain length of time but actually from my experience, the temporary projects that I've worked on have created the, you know, sort of often the biggest kind of reaction with people or the, the, the you sort of have these really strong vivid memories of something being in place which is not there anymore and yeah, there's kind of acts of sort of, yeah, people gathering and being there for, for a particular event or something, I think they have, I think there's real potency within that, that sort of temporary kind of space for people. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it, it, at Loughborough, so year, by year 10, which is next year, I'm hoping to do something where the people that have been coming every year for a harvest festival, yeah. where it's not so, we do a walk, but there's n it's not so participatory. I'm kind of building up, I'm, I'm like my sense is that people are building up the courage to become more per performative and by year 10. <laughs> 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 we'll do something where people really embody something as part of a celebration yeah. and um i'm constantly told oh it's too risky it's too artistic it's too creative if you're looking at that work from an arts background you'd be like oh is that really art <laughs> so there's there's people that are really nervous about coming into the public space and because you mentioned working with radar who were based there so that's interesting then so because you know i've known about their projects and stuff for a while and so is that is that i'm assuming is that that's not their response is that kind of from a wider kind of university context then that they're resistant against what you're trying to do there perhaps or yeah it's because i mean i'm talking dealing with people that, that yeah. they're great for example the grounds team they love fruit roots for the fruit trees mm -hmm. and then they get really freaked out by some of the stuff that i do there which is more experimental yeah, yeah. but they're starting to come yeah towards it well 10 years but that's a lot it's met it's many steps yeah yeah absolutely and otherwise we're only just going to be talking to the people that are already confident and, and up for doing stuff yeah. so building those that trust and their relationships already there <laughs> yeah. it does yeah which is sort of that's what i just can never get you know so that's my biggest frustration that you, you know you the briefs for public art to, and now you know sort of pub, public engagement is sort of you know the way that it's talked about in these types of briefs or in a kind of wider visual arts context about actually the understanding of what it takes to get that sort of real deep sort of you know sort of engagement and trust from people into these projects and yeah you, you i think know. it's may, it might be different if people in their community it depends on your text a lot so if you're in a community and yeah. someone who's the kind of leader does something then other people might do it because yeah. they're doing it so they trust them 
if you're in a workplace maybe that's why at Loughborough it's a bit harder mm. it's a workplace so it hasn't got that it's a different kind of environment yeah and people are a little bit like they take the mic I don't know I, I I'm really interested in, in it it's a fascinating space to work because it's got its own it's its own little fiefdom universities yeah. have their own sets of rules <laughs> Yeah. they're not they're public spaces but they're not they all they're all different they all set yeah. their own yeah ground yeah. Rules. yeah so um, when I was at situations it was part of the University of the West of England until for about 10 years and then we spun then the come and then we spun it out as an independent organization just because the kind of mechanisms of part of the university were just totally clashed with trying to do these you know, very large and sort of complex and sort of a very unusual, you know, sort of um, public art projects. It was um, it was a diff very, very difficult context to work within quite often. <laughs> so, yeah, um, like you say, they're very separate spaces, you know, they're sort of, in, you know, they're spaces within themselves. And yeah, yeah I definitely agree with you on that. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so the following on, on talking about sort of individual projects and is there particular would you be able to give particular advice to artists then that are sort of wanting to work in these contexts and, and you've had sort of limited experience or haven't ever worked in public space before? Um, um, yeah, so I guess just put the time, I would definitely put the time into building some relationships, which means just getting to know people yeah. without, with, as people. Yes. so I think that's what underpins all of the most successful projects that I've done is that we actually there's people in those projects that like each other <laughs> yeah and we are still in contact even if we're not working together so there's yeah. there's a humanity and there's just I'm not it's not about a transaction there's, mm. it's beyond that um and that comes from I guess curiosity around about people <laughs> so make sure you've got that um yeah this idea of piloting something i think is quite good um i also quite often write a vision document really early on which is just a few sentences which imagine what might happen yeah because then you and then i kind of have the courage to say it which is always a little bit nerve-wracking in the beginning but to because again because of the process is process based and relational just to, to to know where we might be going just helps people have something yeah to imagine yeah so root roots the little vision statement for that i presented to a group of people that probably have never had anyone do that before and it just helped paint the picture and i just think it's it just yeah it gives some, something to hold on to yeah. um and it can change <laughs> so you don't need to worry about oh well actually it's not become that it's just it's just taking people in that imaginative space yeah. early on yeah. um and yeah putting in the groundwork beforehand making just making sure that that you can try and negotiate as much research time as you can um within your commission so with the ginkgo project there was a really healthy budget for research which was great yeah um and that that research doesn't have to be going to museums or archives it's the, the place can tell you and the people yeah. will tell you everything <laughs> really um and then lots of listening yes so sitting as long as possible i guess with uncertainty at the beginning by just sitting and allowing stuff to come to yeah you yeah. yeah um and then interrogating any ideas that do come so i've got some so i i work with permaculture design principles and i've also got this amazing um, set of questions that i interrogate my projects with <laughs> which i can send to you if you like which are from um somebody called brett bloom okay who's an American artist, five questions where once you think you know what you might be doing, 
um, they kind of help you interrogate it. Mm. And I just think they're fantastic. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and they're about, he's called some questions about our ecology and the society we embody. <clears throat> Um, they're about the many unspoken and hidden politics, ethics, power and economic struggles behind socially engaged art practice. Um, so there's those. So I'll do a kind of review and an interrogation yeah. using those questions and permaculture. Yeah. And then, yeah, just being really respectful of existing relationships that exist in the place. Yeah. The place itself. Yeah. Um, and people yeah 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 so that's some <laughs> yeah. tips yeah, that's really really helpful thank you um and one of the sort of last questions i wanted to ask about was this you know your practice because it connects with the environment and you're you're sort of always working in that in that way do you think you know there's this kind of sense of artists being useful in public space and some artists disagree with that and there's different schools of thought but is that something that's in your mind when you start a project or do you feel like you're or does it sort of come out of a process that you said that you don't sort of envisage too far far ahead you let sort of things unfold organically but is that is that something that's important to you when you're you're working with communities and things like that or? um i've got i mean i've got things that i'm really passionate about so i guess that's going to come into the work yeah yeah. anyway I'm not really up for telling people <laughs> what to do yeah, yeah. or other artists this yeah. is just what I'm doing and I also know that we live at, um we live in a critical moment in yeah. in the history of the planet yeah. so that's the context like are you going to just pretend that that's that's our context yeah. Yeah. so any work that I make now has to have that in the context yeah 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 so it would be a bit ridiculous to ignore that that was happening yeah. when 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 we're all really in, so many things are in at risk and in in danger yeah so um i mean my background i've got a degree in geography and i've worked with i mean i work with climate scientists and mm every day I put my emails I get this amazing I've got this amazing guy called Peter Lippmann who's does a news feed on environmental sort of updates and latest science and to that just has that's part of me so that's going to come out through yeah. the work yeah. Yeah. um yeah. and those are the things I want to talk about so yeah. that's going to be the work but it's not I can't project I can't kind of make the work be in a certain way or I can't say it's going to be useful yeah yeah it's the way that it's the content yeah, yeah yeah no I totally understand that yeah yeah and lastly and it sort of connects with that is that you know I sort of asked you at the beginning about how this current situation with Covid is affecting you and I was just wondering you know sort of what effects do you think might have on sort of working in public space in in the sort of foreseeable future or you know will do you think there will be significant changes going you know that artists will make to how they work with you know communities and yeah i just wonder that's all it's very difficult to answer i'm very aware of that yeah. i wondered if things would already start to coming into your mind or your you know as your you know you've got current projects at the moment and the changes you're having to make to those perhaps and and yeah just yeah so we're so the project that i am still doing this year which is tidelines we are we've made considerable adaptions to that in the last six weeks because it was based on live events it was going to be six monthly live events starting in april <laughs> so um and we've completely shifted that and that's going to have impacts on the whole project obviously because we're just launching mm. so we've now got five activities online that people can do and we're working out how to make to start dialogues with academics yeah um online yeah but in as creative ways as possible so um and then thinking about working one-to-one -one and then small groups as soon as we can but i'm we're trying to get back into the life living world as soon as possible um yeah i mean 
what are effects there's things like the cop climate talks being delayed mm -hmm. which is quite a big deal um and there may be and i think also people will be a bit nervous about participating in big gatherings yeah 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 there's a, there's a project i was working on that involved a coat with sensors in it which changed people's voices as they spoke which has just been put on permanent hold <laughs> until <laughs> i mean it's this kind of unknown sort of people's unknown about the virus and how it transmits and people sharing the coat it's just sort of you know it's kind of off the table for the, for the time i being. know well i've got this this is my this is the wassail bowl i mean <laughs> <Yeah>. god <laughs> We were passing that round in uh, yeah. January to uh, 30 people. So, um, yeah. Yes, I don't, who knows? I suppose it's a way you, you kind of just have to become far more flexible and adaption, you know, sort of, and, and be working in a kind of very reactive way in, in, in a sense um, because of the changing nature of, of, of it. Yeah, I mean, we've got the Tidelines, which is this project that we're, we're adapting to online. We're also doing a tool. I don't like toolkit. It'll be something like a toolkit that will go out that takes those five. So, that, I mean, online is totally discriminatory as well. And lots of people aren't happy with that as an interface. And yeah. um, particularly older people and people that are using the library. I mean, there are, are people that aren't going to be using that. Um, or aren't wanting to use that, which is totally fine. But it also maybe has expanded our reach into people with less mobility. So <laughs> there's pros and cons, but we're designing a, a, a way of getting these questions and our first stage of interaction out into people's home spaces, um, which we can send to them by post, so, uh, or deliver at their houses. Yeah. So there are there are ways of, connecting mm. but because all of the work that i do around um process and dialogue is in con in a context <laughs> all different contexts the context is part of the whole conversation yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is quite hard yeah yeah i totally understand um yeah is a that's sort of gone through i think we've answered all the questions really whereas in sort of conversation or and so i don't yeah unless there's anything you would like to say any, anything else or um questions and there was a couple of things yeah um. i would because there was a question about duration but then i sort of feel like it's been answered quite a lot through you talking in detail about some of the work that you're doing at the moment yeah i mean i think that i think also because i work with the natural rhythms and with food the whole idea of duration becomes really different yeah. when you're working in that yeah. arena because 10 years is just 10 harvests it, it doesn't seem that much no <laughs> yeah. so um those rhythms create a different sense of time and movement of time yeah. So that's, I guess, how I'm trying to think more about if we're keying people into those patterns, which is partly what I'm trying to do, mm. then the projects need to go on longer, but but possibly in a, it, with a different intensity. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That was that was really interesting and just yeah, lovely to talk through all your work and yeah. So thank you very much. All right. Brilliant. Bye. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye.